Krista, nice to chat with you today. Yeah, thanks for having me again. So I always enjoy uh, hosting the quarterlies uh, because it's a chance for us not only to talk about public equities, but also sort of the macro landscape, uh, what's going on in rates, markets, credits, and of course, how that feeds into uh, equity markets. Um, and you're an excellent person to speak to for that, given your fixed income focus. Um, the, this quarter was a particularly interesting one as it was the first time, uh, or at least the Bank of Canada anyway, sort of got off the sidelines um, with their first policy action of the cycle. Um, so I think that would be a great place for us to start. Can you walk us through uh, the policy action that we saw in the quarter, as well as the underlying economic data that prompted that action? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we're at the beginning of global central banks starting the easing cycle. They're shifting um, from tighter policy to something less restrictive, particularly in, in economies where we've seen growth weaker and inflation move closer to target. So uh, this quarter, we saw both the Bank of Canada and the ECB lower rates by 25 basis points. Um, in both cases, the central bank has communicated that any easing is going to be you know, slow, moderate, data dependent. Uh, so what does that mean? You know, if inflation starts moving higher again or starts surprising to the upside, they're going to slow the pace of easing, maybe even stop altogether. But it also means that the easing cycle is going to look a lot different than the hiking cycle. And when they were raising rates, inflation was moving rapidly higher. Uh, and so they needed to hike rapidly. They were hiking, you know, 50, 75, even 100 basis points in any given meeting. Currently, inflation is easing at a gradual pace. And so the easing cycle is going to be gradual. So they're going to be cutting gradually. In terms of sort of what to expect going forward, you know, I think unless there's a more material slowdown in, in growth or employment losses, we should expect to, to see the Bank of Canada cut uh, in 25 basis point intervals. Uh, we shouldn't be surprised if they skip a meeting or two here. Uh, and again, outside of a recession, we think they'll cut 100 to 150 basis points this cycle and kind of get back to three, three and a half percent. So to your point there about uh, slow and steady cuts um, and maybe even meetings where we don't have cuts, um, the Fed has not moved uh, as of yet. Um, so there is at least a little bit of divergence in central bank policy. Uh, do you expect that to continue? Do you expect that to widen? Um, how would you sort of characterize the different moves across the central banks? Do they need to act in unison? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, can there be a divergence uh, in central bank policy? Yes. You know, I think, you know, the Bank of Canada can continue cutting rates while the Fed is on hold. Can it be a material divergence? You know, will the Bank of Canada start cutting while the U.S. is raising rates? I think that's less. I think sort of the the way I think about it or or the important thing to remember is at this stage, I wouldn't actually classify what's happening as a major divergence. We're at the end of a global tightening cycle. What I see happening now is countries are tweaking policy to sort of better fit their domestic markets. However, all central banks are still in restrictive territory. And so when we look at, at Canada, we obviously have higher debt levels, which is contributing to growth being slower, inflation being lower. And so they're tweaking policy to factor that in. In the US, growth has been more robust, and so they may not need to ease as much. But the main takeaway or sort of the thing I keep in mind is both countries over the next year are going to maintain a restrictive policy and start inching towards a neutral stance. One thing we used to hear a lot of, and maybe there's a little, at least I've heard less chatter about it of late, is really about the yield curve inversion. Um, so it's it's something that has been in the case for, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, at least a year or two, um, where shorter term yields are higher than longer term yields. That's obviously starting to be addressed with the cuts, um, but the curves are still inverted. From what I recall, that was supposed to be a sign of imminent recession. And obviously that's not come to be at least yet. So uh, if you could just give us an update on the state of the curve and and what's going on in terms of the signals that that might be uh, suggesting. Yeah. So as you mentioned, the yield curve is still inverted in Canada. The Bank of Canada overnight rate is 475, which is obviously higher than the Canadian 10-year rate, which is closer to 350. Um, the way I think about the yield curve is, you know, when the yield curve is inverted, it suggests that the market believes policy is restrictive. And if policy is restrictive, uh, it's because you're trying to slow growth, you're trying to slow inflation. And so obviously, if you keep policy restricted for an, uh, for an extended period of time, you typically end up in a recession. I don't know if a lot of that has changed. Um, right now, you kind of alluded to this, but right now the yield curve has been inverted for 
almost two years. That's definitely longer than average. On average, it's about you know a year and then you see the recession. However, it's actually not the longest on record. Um, in the ladies, we saw the yield curve uh, remain inverted for over two and a half years before the recession showed up. Uh, and so for me, the takeaway is policy is restrictive, growth is slowing, probably going to continue slowing. And when that happens, there's a good chance that uh, uh, we will end up in a recession at some point, but the timing is unknown. So you mentioned earlier in one of your responses about the neutral rate. We're going to try to move, or I guess central banks are going to try to move towards the neutral rate. So another term for that is R star, right? So the letter R and then star, which is really that long-term neutral rate where growth is either, the policy is, is either not accommodative or restrictive. So it's kind of in that sweet spot. Um, there's been talk of, uh, at least of whether that R star, so that neutral rate it should be higher going forward than it was in the past um, because of inflation issues, uh, deglobalization, demographic shifts, what have you. Um, do you think that that's still a relevant uh, conversation? Is that neutral rate potentially going to be higher? Uh, through this cycle than last cycle? Because that, of course, would have implications on what central banks are going to do in terms of how much they might cut. Yeah. I mean, I think the first thing to keep in mind is the neutral rate is highly theoretical, uh, but it is one, as you mentioned, that central banks use to gauge how tight or easy policy is. Um, has it drifted higher? I think there's a lot of evidence that would suggest it has. I think the real question is how much higher. Um, in Canada, for example, the Bank of Canada thinks it's somewhere between two and a quarter and three and a quarter. They've recently just moved that modestly uh, higher. Um, it's probably close to that, probably closer to the higher end of the range. Maybe it's three, maybe it's three and a half. Um, Canada still has a lot of debt to work through, which is restricting growth and inflation. We did get a boost from immigration, but I think uh, the pace of that is slowing. And so although I think the neutral rate is higher uh, in Canada than pre-COVID, I think there's a lot of structural issues that we still face, which will restrict how high rates can go. Now, I think the harder question is the U.S. You know, the Fed believes the the neutral rate or so the long term average Fed funds rate is 2.8 percent. But if you go back in history, you know, pre financial crisis, the neutral rate was thought to be four to five percent. It was really through the the financial crisis, post financial crisis, that it declined materially. And that made sense. I mean, there was a significant amount of private sector deleveraging uh, that was happening in the U.S., which was restricting growth. Now, that deleveraging has happened. Growth is in a much better state. Obviously, you know, you mentioned um, inflation is is higher, and so I don't think it's out of the question to think that the neutral rate actually goes back to a level similar to pre-financial crisis. At the very least, it's likely higher than what the Fed is sort of pinpointing today. Okay. So if I was to, I guess, to summarize that, growth decelerating, obviously we've started cuts in some jurisdictions, about to perhaps start them in others. Um, inflation maybe being a little bit stickier than sort of the long-term average, um, but it is being tamed. If we were to then shift to asset class returns and what sort of happened in the, in the actual financial markets, uh, or sorry, the capital markets, um, let's start with equities. So it, overall, I guess it was a very strong quarter, uh, varied by geography, a little less so in, for example, Canada, but you know, you look at the U.S. and some other uh, global regions, very strong returns. A lot of the same themes that we've probably been talking about for for a good year, year and a half now. Um, but none, nonetheless, if you could if you could sort of talk about some of those key themes, uh, particularly in the context of you know returns or ap relative returns, at least for some of our funds, have been a bit weaker. Uh, we've had less AI exposure, particularly semiconductor exposure. That's hurt us a bit over the last, particularly three months, and even the one year uh, quite significantly, not in every asset class, but generally speaking across the equity platform. So if you could walk us through some of those key themes, that'd be great. Yeah. I mean, as you mentioned, equity markets did quite well uh, last quarter, most, or this quarter, uh, most reaching new highs. And it was really a continuation of what we saw in Q1. You know, similar to Q1, the strength was primarily driven by a narrow segment of the market sort of notably technology or really anything related to technology. Um, so from a sector perspective, obviously information technology sort of led all sectors in terms of performance as the demand for semi semiconductor chips continued. Um, communication services was another top performer in large part due to Google. Uh, and the utility sector, sector did quite well. And even that has been impacted by this technology theme as you know, AI exuberance has led to the expectation that more data centers are going to be built, which is going to lead to more uh, electricity demand. 
And so that theme has really helped our holdings in, you know, manufacturers like Taiwan Semiconductor, TMSC, um, ASM International, ASML, as well as some of the data providers we hold like RELX and Walters Kluwer. Now, NVIDIA is obviously a major winner of uh, this technology theme. And this is one we're watching closely. You know, at this stage, our view is the valuation really doesn't properly reflect uh, the wide range of outcomes that could happen to this company. And so because of that, we believe it's trading above its intrinsic value. And so, you know, despite the temptation to sort of chase the current trend, we believe the best strategy is really sticking to our philosophy and sticking to our process on this one. Another major theme in equity markets has been consumer weakness. Uh, there's a growing concern around consumers as, you know, high inflation has been eroding purchasing power. Uh, so obviously luxury good companies, uh, as well as companies such as Sleep Country and Pet Value have been hurt, hurt by this. Now on the positive side, Do Dollarama has done quite well through here as their business model is more shielded from consumer weakness. And actually, they really benefit when consumers become more price sensitive. Um, okay, so that's been a great recap on the equity side. Um, I guess a little closer to to home for you is the credit markets. And I guess what's the state of the credit markets been? Doesn't seem like spreads have moved too much. Um, anything to report there that's noteworthy? So we saw a small widening in credit spreads this quarter. Both investment grade and high yield widened around three to five per, uh, three to five basis points. Now, keep in mind, spreads have been tightening since the middle of last middle of last year. We're closing it, if not at all time tights, particularly in the US. So I would classify um, what happened last quarter more as a stabilization of spreads versus a widening. Now, in terms of cracks, we're not really seeing anything from a broad market perspective. You know, there's still risks in the commercial real estate sector. That's a theme that's been playing out for over a year and sort of we expect to continue to play out. With spreads closing in on all-time tights, we do see the market as being in, uh, expensive relative to history, and that's resulted in us focusing on higher quality names in both, both the Canadian and global strategies. Now, even in expensive markets, opportunities do exist, and I think this quarter Videotron is a really good example of that. You know, our process indicated it had a strong market share and it was really committed to its debt reduction plan and as a result, suggested that it was trading wider than fundamentals. Uh, last quarter, we saw that thesis play out. Videotron spreads tightened 80 to 90 basis points, uh, and the rating agencies actually upgraded the company to uh, investment grade. I think that holding really benefited our, our global credit strategies, uh, and I think it does a good job of demonstrating sort of what we're doing on the credit side. Yeah, no, I, I love that example of Videotron because sometimes we're talking about asset classes um, and we say rich or um, expensive or cheap. You know, we're talking obviously high level terms. Um, we're talking basically the beta in the market, right? So the, the risk in the market generally, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there aren't any opportunities. There's always underlying opportunities, whether it's the equity markets or on the credit side. It's just really a question of being a little bit more selective perhaps when, when spreads are tight. So when valuations are rich um, and also then dialing up and down portfolio risk. Um, so yeah, no, that's, a, that's an excellent example. Um, as always, I like to finish our conversation with an update on any activity in terms of asset mix. Uh, you sit on the committee, so were there any updates in the quarter? Um, also key themes that the committee's uh, focused on and, and any other closing thoughts you'd like to share? Yeah, I mean, I think you mentioned it earlier, but it's obviously been a more challenging three months, you know, even 12 months for our balance strategies. I think this quarter, you know, under under exposure in semis or semiconductors and big tech AI has kind of hurt us on a relative basis. We do have exposure here, obviously. However, it's just not as much as the benchmark. Uh, and we also got hurt again by our, our um, uh, consumer focused businesses. Now, having said that, we do believe the right path is to sort of stay tr true to our philosophy and stay true to our process. Now, in terms of changes on the quarter from an asset mix perspective, um, there hasn't been any real changes. We do believe risks are elevated at this time, both upside and downside risks. And given we're looking to sort of build portfolios that are resilient across a number of scenarios, we continue to be neutral equities, overweight bonds, and underweight cash. Awesome. Well, appreciate that, Krista. It was, it's always nice to chat with you, and uh, I guess I'll see you next quarter. Mm -hmm.